Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Imposters Math Biology Podcast. This is Danny Galvis. Today will be the first part in a series on oscillators and synchronization, and we'll be looking at the Kuramoto model. So this channel is all about bringing gentle introductions to the big ideas and methods we use in math biology. Even though I've been studying this field for over 10 years, I'm constantly confronted with how little I actually know outside of my own corner of expertise. And I wanted to change that. So what I thought we could do is to collaborate with experts in specific topics relevant to math biology and present them in a digestible way. I'm hoping that videos like this can provide a nice entry point for new students or postdocs when starting out in a new field, or they can be linked in the abstracts of talks at conferences so that people have an introduction. If you're interested in working with me on a topic, the contact info is in the description. We can talk about a recent paper or your PhD thesis if you're an early career researcher or a classic paper in your topic. Okay, so today we're going to talk all about oscillations, which are things that move rhythmically or repeatedly in a periodic fashion. Many examples exist, but I'll just name a few. So we can think about mechanical devices like clocks or metronomes, pendulums or gears, uh, or we can think of them as mathematical constructs. We have things like sine waves, cosine waves, and if we put those on a complex plane, we get Euler's formula, which is the equation of a circle. And really, you can think about these uh, three functions as being really related. So if you imagine having a spring and an oscillator is climbing up the spring uh, in time, and you look from the front angle, what you would see is a sine wave. And if you look from the side, you would have a cosine wave. And if you look down from the top, what you would have is a circle. Uh, other examples from physical systems and biological systems are things like stars and planets. A common metaphor is to think about people walking or walking around a track or running around a track. You can think of audio waves where pitch is determined by the frequency and loudness determined by the amplitude, uh, the activity of neurons firing action potentials, or the rhythmic beating of the heart. And another common example for the Kuramoto model is the idea of fireflies flashing rhythmically. What we're going to be looking at in particular is the concept of having oscillators that are nearly identical, so very similar to each other, and weakly coupled, which means that they really only exert small nudges on each other to uh, try to become more similar. So we can think about these fireflies flashing rhythmically, and if they're receiving signals from each other, they may synchronize. Similarly, runners around the track may be trying to keep up with one another, or Populations of neurons in the brain may synchronize in an effort to produce a more strong signal. Uh, or we can think about metronomes on a moving plane, which can become synchronized as well. For the Kuramoto model, it might be useful to start with the equation for a single node, which is actually just the equation of a line. So what we have is the change in angle theta is over time is equal to a constant value, which is the intrinsic frequency omega. And the solution to this equation is theta at time t is equal to the intrinsic frequency times time plus an initial condition. So if we have three examples uh, with different intrinsic frequencies, we'll get something like this. So in this case, we have theta 1 has a smaller intrinsic frequency, so it's a line with a lower slope, and theta 3 is an oscillator with a larger frequency, and so it has a steeper slope. And solutions of this equation are called trajectories or solutions, and they represent, given some initial condition, these, these equations for the line. So these would be three different trajectories for three different parameters omega. But really, it's more useful to think about these things as being periodic, and really the angle is repeated with 2 pi around a circle. So usually uh, the way this is represented is just to say that theta plus 2 pi is actually equal to theta. And so what we have instead is some equations that look a bit more like a sawtooth. So at 2 pi, uh, the value of the uh, theta i or theta 1, 2, or 3 gets replaced with 0. And we get something that looks like this. And you can see 
The theta one is oscillating more slowly. It has slower sawtooths. It has fewer of them over the same amount of time. And theta three has the most. It's probably one of the easier ways or easiest ways to look at this system is to think about it as being directly on a circle. And so the way to do that is just to take um, some radius, which uh, usually is just chosen to be one, and then plot cosine theta on the x-axis and sine theta on the y-axis. And what we end up is something that looks like this, where the oscillators are now moving in time and we can see them moving around the circle. So what we can do is essentially subtract the influence of one of the oscillators uh, by imagining that we are essentially following the oscillator. So you can imagine being an ant or something living on, say, the intermediate speed oscillator. And in that frame, you don't see that second oscillator move, but you do see faster oscillators move away or slower oscillators move away in the backwards direction. So something like this. And those equations are done with a change of variables. So we can define uh, theta hat sub i is equal to theta i, and then subtract the intrinsic frequency times time of, let's say, the intermediate oscillator. If we take the derivative of this, then what we end up with is the rate of change of theta hat i is equal to omega i minus omega 2 in this case. And so you can see that theta hat 2 is never changing, whereas theta hat 3 is always moving forward and theta hat one looks like it's moving backwards. So the coupling that we'll look at for the Kuramoto model is called sinusoidal coupling, and it's given by following equation. So now we have the oscillator again, change of uh, theta of the node i uh, over time is equal to the uh, intrinsic frequency of that node i, plus this uh, coupling term, which is given by k over n, the coupling strength over the number of nodes, times the sum of sine theta j minus theta i over all the j's. So this coupling is sinusoidal because it has this sine component. It's homogeneous because the coupling strength is the same for all of the nodes. And it's all to all because every node i has uh, information from all the other nodes j. And the way we can look at it is by looking at the differences in say two nodes, uh, theta j and theta i. So if they're equal, uh, then the sign of the difference is zero, and what we have is zero coupling. And so if these nodes are on the same place on the track, say the two runners in the same place on the track, they don't influence each other in that moment. Whereas if theta j leads theta i, so that is theta j minus theta i is between zero and pi, then c is greater than zero, and what that means is that the red node, theta i, is trying to catch up to the blue node, theta j. And by this equation and the uh, oddness of, si of the sine function, the theta j will also have a term which is negative, uh, which means that theta j is trying to slow down to allow uh, theta i to catch up with it. Whereas if theta i leads theta j, so theta j minus theta i is between pi and 2 pi, then C is negative, and what happens is that the blue node wants to try to catch up to the red, and the red node wants to slow down to allow the blue node to catch up with it. And if the nodes are exactly opposite one another, then what happens is that the coupling strength is again zero in that moment. And the idea here is that it's kind of a beard and donkey situation. The nodes don't know whether or not to speed up or slow down to catch one another because they're exactly opposite. So it's worth looking at the example of two coupled oscillators because you can do some nice analysis of it. So here we have uh, the equations for the two. And what I've done is chosen some initial conditions. So theta one, the blue node is starting at zero and theta two is starting at pi. And uh, theta, uh, theta two is a bit faster than theta one. So it's got um, an intrinsic frequency of 0 0.9. And then we added some coupling. So if you look at what happens along this uh, trajectory, what you can see is that the faster red node catches up to the blue node and actually passes it, and then they stay at a constant phase difference from one another. So this is called 
frequency locking, where they have the same period, but they're not exactly synchronized. And we can use, do some analysis to see um, how this happens. So the first thing we want to do is uh, simplify the model a little bit. So what we're, what we're really interested in here is not what theta 1 and theta 2 are doing themselves, but rather what the difference in the thetas are doing. So what we can define is a phi, which is equal to theta 2 minus theta 1. And we can also define big omega as equal to omega 2 minus omega 1. And then we can look at the difference in the rates of change of theta 2 and theta 1, or the rate of change of phi, which gives us this equation. And if we do some rearranging, then what we end up with is the change in the change in phi or the change in the phase difference over time is equal to big omega plus k over 2 times sine of negative phi minus sine of phi, or just big omega minus k sine phi. And what you can see here is that we've essentially moved to a frame where uh, node 1 doesn't move and it's pinned to 0, and we see what the red node, the faster node, does around it. And what you can see is that it moves around, passes the blue node, and then stops. And what's useful about this frame is that even though we know that the oscillators are actually moving around the track, we're only seeing them stationary. And so this equation will allow us to look for stationary points or fixed points. Stationary points are given by the rate of change of phi, in this case, uh, over time, is equal to zero. And if we find a phase difference, phi star, such that uh, this equation is equal to zero, this is called a fixed point. And what we know is that if we start at that fixed point, then we stay at that fixed point. So if we start at um, phi equals phi star at time zero, then phi will equal phi star for all time. So for this equation, we have that zero is equal to big omega minus k sine phi, or sine phi is equal to big omega over k. And because of the range of sine, a fixed point will only exist if big omega over k is between or equal to uh, negative one and one. And in our example, what we have is that big omega is equal to 0 0.3 and k is equal to 0 0.4. So the, uh, the quotient is equal to 0 0.75. And what we have uh, to try to find a fixed point is the arc sine of 0 0.75, which is approximately 0 0.85 or pi over 4. So there's actually two fixed points uh, within 0 and 2 pi in this example, but it's a bit easier to look at it as uh, looking at the intersection of the horizontal line, big omega over k, and the sine function. So we want to find when those two things are equal so we can look at the intersections of those two equations, which is drawn in the bottom panel there. And we have the sine wave in black and the, uh, the horizontal line in blue. And the fixed points are given by horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical lines, which are in red. And what we can say is that when sine of phi is equal to big omega over k, those are the fixed points, but when sine of phi is bigger than the big omega over k, what we have is that phi is less than zero. And so that tells us that phi should be decreasing, the phase difference should be uh, moving in the left direction. And if sine of phi is less than big omega over k, then the uh, change in phi over time should be bigger than zero, so the phase difference should be increasing. And if we look at our example, what we can see is that between zero and the leftmost fixed point, what we have is that the sine function is smaller than big omega over k. So b should be moving to the right, and that's shown as a black arrow. Between the two fixed points, we have that the sine function is bigger. So things should be moving to the left. And past the second fixed point, we have that the horizontal line is bigger than sine again and we should be moving to the right. And so in this movie, what we can see is a many different initial conditions. So what we can say about our fixed points is that one of them appears to be stable because all of the trajectories appear to move towards it, whereas the other fixed point, the right fixed point, looks to be unstable because everything wants to move away from it. And in fact, that's true. So the only uh, fix, uh, sorry, the only trajectory that won't move towards this fixed point is the one that starts exactly on the unstable fixed point. 
Now, if we change omega over k a little bit and just set it equal to exactly one, uh, what happens is that the horizontal line only touches the sine function right at its peak. And so if we look again at what the equation should be doing, we can see that to the left of the fixed point, and now it's the only fixed point, it's the only intersection, uh, things should be moving to the right towards pi over two. And if we're a little bit to the right of that fixed point, the horizontal line is still bigger than sine. And so things should again be moving to the right. So what actually happens now is that all solutions will eventually go towards that fixed point, except that they may have to move right all the way around the circle, loop back, and then come in. Now, if we choose uh, omega over k equals something bigger than one, what we end up with is no intersections. And in this case, everything is just gonna always move to the right. However, what we can see is the ghost of the fixed point where the horizontal line and the sine function are very close to each other. So the rate of change of B is quite small there, whereas it's faster elsewhere. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about today was the example of n homogeneous coupled oscillators in the Kuramoto model. So in this case, what we have is that the intrinsic frequency is a uh, constant and it's the same for all of the nodes. And what you get is a simulation that looks like this, where all the nodes are traveling around the track, but eventually they start to catch up with each other and they become synchronized. So now they're all moving at the same frequency and they're also moving in the same phase. And we can again look at the idea of having a moving frame where we subtract the intrinsic frequency times time and that gives us this equation, which is d theta hat bt uh, for each node i is given by k over n times the sum of the sine of the differences. And what goes away is that initial term, which is the omega term. And what you can see now is that all of the nodes look like they're moving forward or backwards around this blue dot to speed up and slow down, but you don't see them spinning around. And this line and blue dot here are representing the average phase of the nodes as well as the coherence. So the length of this is the coherence and it varies between zero and one. So here you can see that uh, the coherence is very close to one and so they're very close to single. So to analyze this system, first we need to look at the idea of having a mean field. And so we take our equation and what we do is we replace the sine function with the imaginary part of Euler's formula. So we have that e to the i theta where bold i is representing the complex number. Then that's equal to the cosine theta plus i sine theta. And what we have is that the imaginary part e to the i theta is equal to sine theta. And so what we can do is just replace sine theta j minus theta i with imaginary part e raised i theta j minus theta i. We can pull out the imaginary part without any problems, as this is a sum. And then we can uh, separate theta i and theta j by having that e to the i theta j is equal to, or time, sorry, e to the negative i theta i. And then finally, we just notice that e to the i theta i is in each of these terms in the sum, and so we can pull it out. And then we notice that this term here, which is one over n, or sum from j equals one to n of e to the i theta j is actually common to all of the nodes. All of the nodes are receiving this signal from all of the other nodes. And so this is an idea of a mean field. And so we name this thing the Kuromoto order parameter and usually look at it in the following way. So we say that R, which is the phase coherence in zero to one, that the length of the line, the blue line that we saw earlier, times E raised I B, which is the average phase, which was the angle of that blue line, is equal to that sum. And if we return back, what we end up with is that D theta I DT is equal to the imaginary part of R times K times e to the negative theta i times e to the i b. And finally, we can get that d theta i dt is equal to r times k times sine of b 
minus theta i. So this is a mean field because all of the nodes are receiving this same uh, information from R B. And then we look at one uh, last transformation that is useful, and that is just to notice that the vector field we're looking at is invariant under phase shifts of all the nodes simultaneously. So here I have an example of some nodes and their R and phi. And what you can see is that if I shift it so that now R uh, is the same, but phi is, is at angle zero, uh, all of the nodes are the same relative to each other. And so the vector field determining their movement forward or backwards will always will also be the same. And here is just a visualization of that in the equations where you can just add epsilon to all of the theta j's and theta i's and notice that they cancel. So what we can do is we can shift to a moving frame where phi is a constant value and without loss of generality, phi is equal to zero, which gives us that d theta i dt is equal to negative r times k times sine theta. And I do want to point out that uh, you can't really simulate the dynamics of this system using this equation, but it does help us to find fixed points and look at what the system uh, is doing. And I did include an example of why the, the top equation with the phi included, where phi is calculated, and the bottom where phi is chosen to be zero doesn't work in simulation. That's in the GitHub, which is uh, in the description. And you, can, um, and you can kind of see some examples where what happens is that phi, uh, even though it starts at zero, it moves around a little bit. And so in the bottom equation, because we're assuming that V is zero, it doesn't actually produce the same result. But here is a simulation where I use the top equation, and all I do is that I subtract out the component of V at each time point, so it covers around zero. And what you can see is that we get the same dynamics as before, except that they all uh, converge on synchronization at an angle zero. And of course, this is in the moving frame, in the, in the actual frame, these things would be rotating around at omega frequency. So looking at this equation, we can now identify the fixed points. There's the first pick, fixed point, which occurs at r equals zero. So r equals zero is when the system is maximally incoherent. Uh, and what that means, for example, in a system with two nodes is when they're exactly opposite to one another. And in a case with, say, six nodes, it means when they're sort of exactly equally spaced around the circle. And if you think about these nodes and what, they're, what inputs they're receiving, you can kind of see that every node is receiving, for every, for every input that it receives that tells it to move backwards by some amount, it also simultaneously has an input telling it to move forward by exactly that same amount. And so that's why this uh, won't move. It's because all the nodes are being perfectly balanced with one another, even though it's maximally incoherent. And this is going to turn out to be an unstable fixed point, which we'll, we'll see an example of why that might be in a minute. So when we have that R is not equal to zero, then we have all the fixed points that are given either by theta hat sub i equals to zero or pi. And you can have any combination of this. So in this example, for we have five nodes, five of the, so let's say i equals one through i equals five, all taking uh, the value zero, and theta hat of six is equal to pi. So this would be another example of a fixed point. Uh, so these would stay like this um, indefinitely, but uh, it's worth pointing out that this is going to be an example of a saddle point, and what I mean by a saddle point is that it is unstable, which means that this system, if we move one of some of the nodes around a little bit, it's not going to want to stay exactly like this. But there are some ways in which you can get it to, uh, to come back to this state if you perturb it. So an example is, if I now take two of the nodes that are at zero and I move them 
slightly away from zero, but both, but the two of them are moving them in the opposite direction, then what you get is a sort of perfectly balanced situation where the node that's at pi is always seeing exactly the same input, which is zero, because they're being uh, canceled out by the symmetry. And everything is eventually going to move towards the case where we have five at zero and one at pi. So it does have, a, these things have a stable manifold, but they aren't stable because if I were to perturb this in a slightly different way, say move one of these nodes a little bit further away than the other, then everything is going to converge to the fully synchronized state which is the coherent and stable case. And this is where all the nodes now converge to the same point. Okay, so I thought to finish, we could look a little bit at gradient dynamical systems, uh, which will help give us a little bit of an idea about why uh, some of these fixed points are stable or unstable or saddle nodes. But first we need to identify a function V which has uh, the following relationship. So given our original equations, what we need is a function v that has as its independent variables all of the theta hats. So here I'm just using uh, theta hat to represent the vector of all of the theta hats. And we, we need a function that if we take the negative of the gradient of this function, then what we end up with is our original dynamical system. If a function v of this sort can be found, and it's, it's nice enough, which in our case it will be continuous and infinitely differentiable and bounded, uh, so it's a good case, then we'll get some additional information out of it. So I thought first we could look for such a function v, and what I thought uh, and think will work is uh, this v of theta hat which is equal to k times n minus one over two, a constant value. So when we take uh, any derivative, it'll go away, minus k over two n times the sum from j equals one to n, and the sum of k not equal to j to n of the cosine of all the differences. So theta j hat minus theta k hat, it's a bounded and smooth function. Uh, and if we try to take the derivative of this with respect to one of the theta hats, so we start to take the gradient, then the constant term goes away. And what we get is d, d theta hat sub i is equal to negative k over 2n. And the sum of all the j's that are not equal to i to n of cosine theta hat j minus theta hat i plus cosine theta hat i minus theta hat j. So what I did in the original equation was I wanted all the different combinations of cosine theta j minus theta k, except for those that were theta j minus itself theta j. And we get them twice uh, because cosine is an even function. And so theta, uh, cosine theta j minus theta i is the same as cosine theta i minus theta j. So what we end up with is the derivative with respect to some theta hat i of negative k over n, sum j not equal to i up to n of cosine theta hat j minus theta hat i. If we take the derivative there, what we end up with is negative k over n times the sum of j not equal to i to n of sine theta hat j minus theta hat i. And then we can just notice that when theta, uh, when j is equal to i, we get sine theta hat j minus theta hat j, which is just zero. So we can add it back in and we end up with negative k over n, uh, sum from j equals one to n of sine of theta hat j minus theta hat i, which was our initial vector field. So this v uh, should work because now d uh, theta hat i dt is equal to the negative of this thing, of this sum, and then uh, d theta hat dt is equal to the negative gradient of v. So the reason this helps us is because the v that we get from this, it, we can think of it as an energy function. And if we find ourselves at on some point, so if we pick some 
values for the independent variables, in this case, let's say just theta hat one and theta hat two, then that will give us some value V and the trajectory of our uh, dynamical system that we've been looking at will follow the direction of steepest descent along V. So it will go down the steepest hill if we think of V as being a landscape of hills and valleys. It will move in the direction of the steepest downward movement, kind of like if you dropped a ball at a point and watched it roll down the hill. And so you can think of the peaks, so these are the red areas, as being places where you would see unstable fixed points. So if you put a ball on top of one of those peaks, uh, it wouldn't move, but if you were to move it a little bit in the direction of the, the hill, it would then roll down the hill towards one of the minima. And these minima are the stable fixed points. And because this function is bounded, all of the trajectories either stay at some fixed point, whether it's a hill or a trough or a saddle, or they will roll down the hill towards a lower energy. So in this case, it's a, a minimum, but it could also be in very special cases, a saddle. And we'll see some of that in a minute. So for this example, what we have is d theta hat one dt is sine theta hat two minus theta hat one, uh, and the opposite of that for theta hat two. And v, our equation is equal to one minus cosine theta hat two minus theta hat one. The reason I included that constant term initially is because I want this function uh, just for niceness to have a minimum, a global minimum of, of zero, but that one doesn't matter that much. What we can see from this is as I mentioned, the unstable fixed points are the, are the peaks. So those are the cases for two nodes where they're exactly opposite of each other. That's like the white dot here. And trajectories that are perturbed a little bit away from that will move in the direction of steepest descent. That's the white arrow in the direction of the green, which is a global minimum or a local minimum, but in this case, both, which is one of the synchronized solutions. And there is a orthogonal direction that you can imagine to the white, which you can see the color of V doesn't change. And this is because in this example, or in, well, in the homogeneous Kuramoto model, what we have is a continuum of fixed points, anywhere we have a fixed point. And that's because if we are to phase shift all of the nodes, same time. So if we add epsilon to all of the nodes at once, uh, you don't change the vector field. And so that's, that's why we have these uh, diagonal lines that are the level sets. And so, uh, so you, as a trajectory, you don't move in that direction. And really all we need then is the one direction represented by this arrow, because any other trajectories that we look at are the same thing except with a phase shift to all of the nodes. So if I, so these blue uh, lines here represent the phase shift direction orthogonal to the direction uh, the trajectories move in. But here you can see two different examples of trajectories that move from some place close to a peak, some place close to being opposite one another, but then they eventually will converge to the synchronized solution. So lastly, I wanted to look at the case of three nodes, and here are the equations for those. And we can again find a, uh, an equation V. We can do this arbitrarily for the homogeneous case. And what we get is uh, three minus cosine theta hat two minus theta hat one minus cosine theta hat three minus theta hat one, and then minus cosine theta hat two minus theta hat three. So this is hard to plot because it has three independent variables and one dependent variable for which is v um, in the vector field right theta hat one two and three are the dependent variables of time but here uh, for for the gradient dynamical system v is the independent or sorry is the dependent variable and the thetas are the independent variables so what we need to do is remove that direction that's orthogonal to the direction of trajectories where we're adding the same phase to all of the nodes because trajectory yeah so trajectories don't move in that direction 
So we can just kind of omit it. And the way to do this is to find a, a nice basis in R3, which is the one where one of the directions will represent a phase shift of all the nodes. And that's the, the vector, the one vector. So um, the vector that has one in all directions or some scaling of that. And then what we get is that theta hat, now the vector representing all the theta i's, could be equal to c times the one vector plus, and I just picked an, an orthogonal basis. I didn't normalize it, but you get plus c2 of one, one, negative two, plus c3 of one, negative one, zero. We can set c1 to zero without any loss of generality. So we're going to just we're just going to pick one initial sum, let's say, of all of the of all of the thetas, and we know the trajectories will hang out there, and so we can just plot that. And what you get is a graph that looks like this. So we can only we only need to see theta one and theta two because theta three is now a function of of theta two and theta one, and then v is represented as a heat map, and where red is hot large number, so uh, either peaks or high energy, so things want to move away. Um, and then the blue is the troughs where the trajectories want to move in the direction of them. And so, yeah, so if we use this, this basis, what we end up with is these equations for theta hat one, two, and three in terms of C1 and C2. But really what we're doing is we're just saying theta, theta one hat plus theta two hat plus theta three hat is equal to zero or theta three hat is equal to negative theta one hat minus theta two hat. So let's look at what the uh, trajectories actually look like here. And what you can see is, is it looks like it has a lot of um, um, symmetries and repetitions, but we can just look at one example. So here I have the white dot representing a peak, um, a, one of the global maxima of this system. And what you can see is that it's representing uh, the uh, perfectly incoherent state. Which is which has all three nodes uh, exactly, I guess, 120 degrees away from one another. And then, if we were to perturb the system a little bit away from that steady state in the direction of the trough, so that's the white arrow here, what you see is that the trajectory is going to move in the direction of the global minimum, and it's going to go towards the the stable synchronized state. However, if we make a very specific perturbation to this, where what we want to do is we want to move the blue node and the black node uh, away on the white, uh, the white point, so on the incoherent state. If we move the black node and the blue node uh, by some epsilon, but both in the direction of pi, so we add something to the blue and we subtract something from the black, then what you can see is that you're going to travel from your, your global maxima on a V and you're going to travel along the stable manifold of one of the saddle points uh, towards the blue node, which has two nodes at pi and one node at zero. And the reason this can happen is because of the symmetry that we have. So the red node is always going to be receiving the same input from blue and black because we perturbed them by the same amount. And at the same time, the, the black and the blue are both going to be uh, receiving an input, pushing them in the direction of pi rather than in the direction of zero. But uh, this is now... And well, what I should say is that there is a different ways that you can get uh, different stable manifolds that you can follow to get to different equivalent states, but with phase shifts. So now if I move this blue curve and go in this direction, a different direction, then what you see is you end up again with a similar kind of situation where there are two nodes that are opposite the, uh, the one node. Uh, and so it's not the the synchronized state, but you end up with one of these states where some of the nodes are at zero, or well, where some of the nodes are at, at one theta, and then the rest of them are pi away from them. Okay, so that's 
all I really wanted to talk about today, I really want to get on to talking about the heterogeneous Kuramoto model, which is a really interesting model with a lot of uh, richness. Uh, but this has been the Imposters Math Biology podcast. Thanks for listening. And there's uh, several ways you can get into contact. So I have an email address, in, uh, impostormbpodcast at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter uh, at D E D underscore E underscore Galvis. Uh, I'm on, well, you're watching this on YouTube probably. And also there's a GitHub which shows all of the code that I used to generate all of the figures and everything. And here are some of the references. So anyway, um, please do get in touch uh, if you're interested in the project. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing from people and, and seeing what people thought of it. So thank you.